Please open your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of John, chapter 17. The Gospel of John, chapter 17. You know, you, you stop and you ask yourself, what is, it, what is it really that God wants to do? What is it God is trying to do? I, I know we live in the here and now, and so we're, we're kind of wrapped up in what's happening uh, in current events in the government and our own lives. But, you know, when you think about eternity, forever, I mean, really, this life, the Bible says we're like a, a, a smoke. We're here and gone like the uh, blooming of a flower and all of its glory and then it's withered. Okay, so we're going to be here and gone. So what, what is God wanting to do? Why are we still here? Now, we know that the reason why the trumpet hasn't sounded because the Lord of the harvest is patient until he receives the early and latter rain. There is going to be another great outpouring. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I literally, to me, it was physical. I had an angel come into my dormitory. I fell as a dead man. I was in the Navy, and he took me into heaven. And I saw the last harvest of the gathering of every tongue, nation, kindred. And, and he told me this. He said, I would have a part to do with that. And so whether or not that means sowing seed into the future or when I'm literally here, it doesn't matter. But, but we got to find out what God wants. And, you know, really what God wants is transformation in your life. Yes. Amen. God wants you to be transformed from glory to glory to glory. You know, Paul said, I have not yet apprehended that for which I've been apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then he said, therefore, let us, therefore, as many as be like mine did, you know, have the same heart. For in other words, if you got the same heart that Paul did, I'm pressing in. You know, you've got to press in to God's purpose for your life. It's not going to fall on you like ripe cherries off a tree. You've got to press in the vine and take it by force. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to put forth the effort. If you're going to grow spiritually, then you've got to do something. And, the, and, and what God has given to us for this wonderful transformation, he's given us his word. Uh -oh, we got the Holy Ghost, yes. Christ came inside of it. Christ did not come just to save your wretched soul. He came to transform you into his likeness and into his image, into his character and into his personality. And, and you know very well, Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We are dealing with demonic powers. And I'm not devil conscious. I'm Jesus conscious. I know Jesus overcame principalities and powers and made her show them openly triumphing over them in it. So the devil is defeated as far as God's concerned. But it's not good enough for the devil to be defeated as far as God's concerned. It's got to be true in your heart. Amen. The devil's got to be defeated in your heart. You know, I, I tell people all the time, the problem in, in the, a lot of the body of Christ is that they're trying to get healed when they don't realize they already are. That's right. That's right. They already are. But see, until you know that, it doesn't do any good. So I, 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 I want us to take a look. I believe, personally... As I look through all the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, I believe one of the most powerful, powerful revelations that we can receive is revealed to us in the Gospel of John chapter 17. Because Jesus now is going to take us into that holy place, that secret place, where he is communicating directly to the Father. Now, he, he had been communicating with the Father ever since he was in his mother's womb, but he's directly communicating with the Father. And in, in this, there is so much. I mean, I, I, I wrote a whole book on, a very thick book on becoming one with God. And so there's a lot that we could look at in this. But I want us to begin here, and I just want to read this prayer that Jesus prayed. And these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hours come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now notice, he tells us what eternal life is. Eternal life is knowing the only true God. That's eternal life. Jesus said, I am come. I I'm going to do a teaching on why he came. He said, I come to seek and save them and I lost. I, I, I came to uh, heal the sick. I came to deliver people. But he said, he said, Father, I want them to know you. I want them to know you. 
and, and, and he said the day will come when everybody will know God for themselves. You don't have to go through a pope or a bishop or a priest or a nun. You don't have to go through the preacher that has the anointing. No, I'm not, I, I believe in, I, I call them the mantles of the kingdom, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. But why are we here? We're here to equip you that you can do the work of the kingdom. That you can do the work of the kingdom. That's, that's why he gave us those men and women. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So notice, the combination is not just, now he's praying to the Father. And, and, and everything he's, and he knows that this is the last prayer before he, he gets betrayed. And they take him to be crucified. So what he's saying, you know, usually when I leave the house, the very last thing I say to my family is probably the most important thing I have to say. Don't forget. Do this. Do that. He's, th this is his last prayer to the Father except when he's on the cross and when he's in the garden. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. But notice, I have glorified thee on the earth and I have finished the work. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And what he's talking about is, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. So we're talking about when he was the Word. And it says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. So the Word became flesh, received a human name, Yeshua, or Jesus. Okay? So God was made flesh, and God dwelt among us in the person of Jesus. And it says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now, a lot of people, they get all confused about predestination because they say, well, God had predestined us to be his sons. Well, let me, let me, let me tell you how this worked. God knew, see, God knows everything. God knows everything, period. There's nothing that God don't know. Matter of fact, the Bible says he's counted all the dust of the earth. Now, I'm glad I'm not God because God can't help it. That's who God is. God just simply knows everything. He's not a know-it-all. He just knows it all. And so God knew before the foundation of the world those who would respond to the gospel message, who would repent, who would believe, who would follow, who would obey, who would love and die for him. They're the predestinated, the chosen ones. He knew it. He didn't make us his predestinated. He gave us that choice and we chose. See, we have the power to choose. I did a book on the power to choose. Our eternal destiny is by what we choose. What we choose what? Do we choose to believe what God says? Or do we choose to believe what the world says? I'm telling you, this, this actually, is, 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 and what we're talking about is being in harmony with God today. This is God's will. God wants me to be in absolute, perfect, sync, harmony, oneness, unity, agreement with him. That's what God wants. And the good news is once we leave this world, we will be in absolute agreement throughout forever. Those who have already died and went to heaven, they're in absolute agreement with God right now. Forever. I said, woo, ha, forever. But... In this world, we have the challenge because we have the world, our flesh, and the devil, society, and they're trying to get us out of agreement with God. They're trying to get us out of sync with God. They're trying to get us out of harmony with God. Okay, so I, I have a guitar, I didn't bring it over, I, I, I tried to learn how to play it, I never got serious enough about it. How many know you got to get serious to learn to play a good instrument good? I, I never got serious with it. I wanted it, the thought, the ideal was wonderful, but the reality of it was I wasn't willing to pay the price in order to learn how to play that instrument. Now, it's an instrument, but it's got to be tuned up, and it's got to be 
played by someone who is serious. And then there's different levels of playing the guitar. Well, listen, the Bible says in, in, in a great house, there's, there's, there's vessels. And there's vessels of gold and of silver and wood of an earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. But if a man will purge himself of these things, he shall be a vessel unto honor, meet for the master who is used, prepared to every good work. And what this is saying is that you and I are a vessel, we are a temple, we are a tabernacle, we are the house of God. And God says, I want to fill you with my glory. But how many of you know that when it comes to a clay pot and it comes to a gold pot, what you put in the clay pot is going to be different than what you put in the gold pot. So I'm telling you the, 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 the vessels that, that are purged and purified and glorified are going to get more valuable substances put in them. They're all vessels. I'm telling you, you determine to what extent God can move, flow, and operate in your life by how serious you are in coming into harmony with him, into agreement with him. Because really what faith is, I, I, I do a lot of teaching on faith because faith is so important. You can't please God without faith. And he that cometh to God must believe he is and he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. And, and, and so when we talk about faith, because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I, I major on the subject of faith because without, without faith you can't really, you can't get born again. You can't get born again. You can't get filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. You can't move in the power gifts, revelation gifts, and utterance gifts, and that's how the gifts work. He, therefore, that ministereth to you the Spirit, does he do it by the works of law, by the hearing of faith? It's all by faith. It's all by faith. Now, sometimes people can have faith for you. I've had faith for a lot of people, and I prayed for people, and I would say to them, do you believe you're going to get healed before I pray for you? No, no, I just don't believe it. And, and I pray for them, and then you get healed. Because God put it in my heart. Pray for him. I'm going to heal him. Uh, 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 dead people. Dead people can't believe for themselves. So somebody who has faith in God. What's faith in God? You agree with what God says. No if, ands, or but. You agree with what God says. What God's promises are. And so to the degree that I agree with God is to the degree that I can Move in his will. Huh. I can flow and function in that realm of the spirit. The Bible says we're supposed to be like the wind from whence we come and whence we go. No man knows because the world doesn't understand the substance of faith. See, but it's trust, it's reliance, it's confidence. It's when you know that you know that you know. Like when I had that broken foot and I knew I was healed and the devil told me I wasn't. And I got so mad at the devil, my wife saw it, my congregation saw the broken foot, I slammed it down as hard as I could, and I blacked out. And I did it the second time, and I did it the third time, and I did it the fourth time, and every time I blacked out, and the fifth time, it was like my foot was never broke. What was that? I was in harmony with God. I was in perfect agreement with God. I was one with God. You understand it. This is where God's taken us into oneness with him. See, we're not going to change God. He said, I'm the Lord and I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't care what lukewarm, backslidden, passive preacher is behind the pulpit is telling you that God doesn't do those things anymore. And he's right. God won't do them for them because they won't believe. I'm just being honest. They won't believe. Hell is full of people that won't believe. That there was punishment and judgment for those who wouldn't repent and get right. And that's how God operates. He's a God of faith. He said, if you deny me, I can't deny myself. I am who I said I am. And that's who God is. Now, the bad news is for those who refuse to see it the way that God sees it, they're in trouble. The good news is you can believe it the way that God says it. <laughs> You're on the winning side. What about all those poor people who aren't? We're trying to get them to get on the winning side. 
We're encouraging him. We're, 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 that's what preaching's about. Preaching is trying to get people to decide to be on the winning side. I read the end of the book. We win, people. Amen. We're winners and not wieners. <laughs> we're overcomers. We're more than conquerors. We're kings. We're priests. But it's got to become real inside of you. Remember, the kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. See, that's when you can tell you're really moving in harmony with God is when you got joy. Yeah, when you got joy. I said, when you got joy. <laughs> you know you're moving in the Holy Ghost. You know you're in the kingdom. Thank you, dear sister. You know you're moving in the kingdom of God. Isn't that wonderful? I think we ought to give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Now, I'm not even barely going to be able to scratch the surface this morning. But he says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then he says, so as the rain cometh down from heaven, if you read that chapter, he's talking about the word of God. So I want you to notice what Jesus, he's praying a prayer to the Father. He knew the day would come when we would read this prayer and that our eyes would be opened. Now, a lot of people, a lot of leaders in the body of Christ are always talking about revival and awakening. And I believe in all of that, the, the power of God, the glory of God, the anointing. But, but what they don't understand is that all that God can do and wants to do is really revealed to us in what God has already said. You know, people are trying to get God to move. I, I, I don't, I've never tried to get God to move. God just shows up in my life. Incredible miracles, like that woman who was demon-possessed, stabbing me in the face with a knife, and it couldn't penetrate my skin. And, and, and the evangelist saw me, saw it happening by roads. I mean, she's stabbing me in the face, 20 year, 21 years old, and the knife went, when I was standing in two consuming fires, and it was like I was standing in air conditioning when a person on the outside got burnt. I mean, when the glory of God took over my sister's maverick, and it drove itself for over eight hours under the glory. I mean, just miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. I never told you this. After God healed my foot, one day I woke up and it felt like my foot was broken all day. Oh, I could hardly walk on it. So I, I'm doing it by faith, Brother Wayne, all day, because I'm in agreement with God. God, your word says I'm healed. I'm dealing. That's how I've had broken bones healed. I've had hernias healed. I've had tumors disappeared. Why? I agreed with God. I agreed with God. I agreed with God. I agreed. Now, what do you do unless you don't, if you don't believe it? Well, let me tell you something. Who you constantly agree with is who you'll end up believing. So if you're not really moving in that realm where you know that you know that you know you're healed, you're delivered, you're free, just start saying it to yourself because the number one person you believe more than anybody else is yourself. You believe what you say, even if it's the craziest, goofiest, stupidest stuff you ever heard. You believe what you say. So begin to say, I agree with God. I agree with the promises. I agree with the blessings. I agree with the provisions. I agree with his protection. I agree with it, God. And it's not you gabbing and grabbing and confessing again. It's you. It's you communicating and saying, Lord, I agree with you. Let God be true and everybody else a liar. See, I know this in my heart of my hearts. I know this. And that's why I'm so bold. That's why I haven't used the medical world in, in 49 years. Because I know that God can't lie. I know that God promised. I know that he said I'm the surety of the promise. And I know that by his stripes, I was healed. If I were, I was. If I was, I am. And if I am, I is. <laughs> I is healed. We reach up and grab that. I is healed. I is healed. It's mine. I'm not demanding God to do anything. You know why? Because he's already done it. We've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And I'm not talking. I, I, I turn off preachers who are full of hot air. They talk a good story, but there's no evidence of what they're confessing is real. I want, I want the reality of it. That's why I, I picked up men like John G. Lake and Smith Wigglesworth and, and, and guys who have lived in the past. They're not my heroes. They proved 
that they were men who believed what they said. They had the evidence of it. Jesus said, if you don't believe what I have to say, he said, believe the works. Believe the works. My congregation knew back in 1985 when the Lord spoke to me and said, put up a building of 500, that was it, 800 people. And at one time we did have 800 chairs out. We, did, we didn't have this stage that was out here, and we didn't have the sound booth there, and I had 800 chairs out. And uh, we didn't have anything, did we, Donnie? And Lee? We had an empty piece of land. No money, no experience, nothing. And within less than a year, we were in this building. And we just, we just acted by faith. We dug the footers with no money. We poured concrete. We just did. I said, okay, Lord, how to do it? Show me how to do it. I never built a doghouse. Show me. And he began to show us. And just step by step by step, that's how God works. So this is how faith works. You grow. You, you, your faith is like a mustard seed. You plant it in the soul of your heart. You water it. You nourish it. You feed it. You begin to do it. I, I've, got, I've got a book back there, 28 Ways How Faith Comes. It was a divine revelation, and as God gave this revelation, I realized it was things I've, all, I've been doing all my life as a Christian. And my faith grew, my faith developed, my faith matured. How? To take a hold of God. See, God wants you to take a hold of him. Yes. Tell somebody, take a hold of God. Yes. But you got to let go of the world. you got to let go. you got to stop putting your confidence in the arm of the flesh. We, we got to trust God. Now, don't misunderstand me. I have helped a lot of people in the midst of them not knowing how to trust God and watching them mature and develop and grow in God because I'm growing in God. I'm maturing in God. I'm developing God. One time, I, I, I got to the place where I began to depend too much on the world for finances and the equities in my houses, and it blew up in my face in 2013, what, 2008, when Obama got in. I had all these houses because I used all this equity. And when my renters couldn't pay, I, I didn't want to kick them out. I lost everything. And I personally went through bankruptcy. Not the church. I went through bankruptcy. And I got myself into $1.7 million of debt. I mean, that's how much real estate I had. I mean, I mean I, I, in the eyes of the world, I mean, I got $1.7 million. But guess what? It was, it was, it was a, a mirage. Because when the economy went up and my renters couldn't pay and I, couldn't, I didn't have the heart to kick them out, I just lost it all. And, and I, I found out that, uh, man, and then I found out when they take away your investment property, I didn't know this, so they, they sold two of my properties that were worth over $300-some thousand dollars for $60,000, $70,000. My head said this, that was their loss. And then they, they came after me, and I said, wait, wait, I, I didn't think. They said, no, it was investment property, so we sold the land for 60000 but you owe us 280000 And then the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, a wicked man borrows money with no intent to pay it back. I wasn't a wicked man. The economy went belly up, and he spoke to my heart. He said, son, I, that's why there's laws in our land to protect people. And he spoke to my heart, and he said, you can go through bankruptcy, but don't ever do it again. I said, okay, God, I won't do it again. And from 2014 to then, I'm not looking to the world to help me financially, per se. I'm basically looking to God. Praise God, this church is out of debt. We got a little bit of debt on the parsonage, but not much. But, you know, God is good. Tell somebody God is good. God wants you to come into agreement with him. If two be not agreed together, they can't walk together. God wants you to agree with him. Stop agreeing with the, the medical prognosis. I wrote a book called, I Do Not Accept Your Prognosis. I don't need their prognosis. I don't need to know the expert. I'm not talking about you don't go out here and get wisdom from the world if you're doing something mechanically or, or, or with a building or something else, you know, or a tax consultant. I'm just saying that you hear from God. How many know that you can hear from God? Will you agree with that? I don't think. I don't think one time in all of these years I've ever personally said God doesn't talk to me. People tell me, that God, God, Pastor, but God doesn't talk to me. I said, I'll tell you why he doesn't talk to you. Because you are getting what you're saying, whether you know it or not. Right. 
Jesus said, you can have what you say. Now, you know, for years I wore glasses. Nothing wrong with wearing glasses. I was wearing glasses, you know, and no big, you know, I don't care what people think about me. But well, well, back in 2011, it, it just came to me. Well, now, wait a minute. Moses, his, his eyes were not dim and his strength was not abated. I said, okay. I know, how many know stepping on your glasses don't get you healed? <laughs> I did it. It didn't work. I smashed my glasses and had to buy a new set. I said, okay, what can I do? Okay, prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. So I know that most of you having a manifestation is you go into that place of now praising God is done. And so I did for three months. I'm just praising God. Hallelujah, my eyes are healed, they're whole, praise God. Not to anybody else, not to my wife, to me. As I'm walking around, I say, Lord, I thank you I don't need these glasses. I thank you I'm healed from these glasses. I thank you that I'm set free. Now I'm doing it for a new set of teeth. Smith Wigglesworth went to bed with a rotten set of teeth. He said his teeth were rotten his whole life. He got up the next morning, he had a brand new set of teeth in his mouth. How many want to wake up with a brand new set of teeth in your mouth? Yeah, you might have to take your dentures out. I don't know. But so I'm standing here, back here one day in 2011. I'm telling you, the words up on the screen, I couldn't, they were blurry without my glasses. I'm standing in the back and all of a sudden, the words, I mean suddenly, say suddenly. suddenly. The words were all blurry. I went, what? I thought something was wrong with my glasses. I took my glasses off, put them back on, wiped them, and the words are still blurry. Then I took my glasses off, I looked up, and they were as clear and as crystal as you can imagine. Amen. But that was three months of just praising God. Lord, I thank you. Praise the Lord. I'm free from these glasses. I don't need to have these glasses. I thank you, Lord. I'm delivered from these glasses. Now, I'm not judging anybody who's wearing glasses. I'm not judging anybody for anything. I don't judge people if they go to the medical world. I don't go, well, I'm more than you are. No, get out of here. I'm nothing without Christ. There's no pride in this thing. The Bible says if man has faith, let him have it to himself. All I know is when I compare myself to Jesus, I'm like, help God. <laughs> you know, compared to Jesus, don't come comparing yourself one to another. Are you not carnal? So I don't compare myself. Oh, well, praise God, I believe, I believe, and you don't. Get out of here. That's, that, that's just so, I'm so far beyond that that I don't even think that way. So when somebody calls me and says, Pastor, I've got to go to the doctors, and they're going to do such and such operation on me, and I'll say to them, Jesus did. Okay, how do you want me to believe? Well, believe I'm not going to get an infection and that I'm going to come out of this okay. And I'll say, okay, well, let's go for it. I don't even try to get them to believe because that's where they're at. And that, you know what, though? You can go from there. When a child is given, I've had the privilege of delivering three of my own children. Two of them, the midwife didn't make it. The first child, my wife wanted to have home birth. I didn't have enough faith. Ran her off to the medical world. They messed her up. And she kind of basically said to me, now, honey, will you let me do what I want? I said, okay, baby, you can and so she began to confess. She walked around with this little book written by, uh, I can't remember the person's name. And so here on Christmas, uh, cold, cold December of 1983, she uh, wants to get up and go down, because upstairs it wasn't heated on an old farmhouse. She went downstairs and she... Uh, she got what she wanted, and she said, oh, I got to go to the bathroom in the bottom of my heart. Uh, uh, she, I said, no, we, 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 not, we got a little bathroom upstairs. She said, honey, it's cold up there. I mean, there's frost on the inside of the windows. I said, I don't know why. He's God. I said, you're not using the bathroom down here. What? You're not using the bathroom down here. So, uh, so I pushed her up the stairs. I had to. You know, she was big with Daniel. She gets up there, and. She gets in there, on, uh, on, on, which was right next to our birthing room. She sits down, and her water broke, and here comes Danny's head. I said, what in the world? I had to waddle her over to the birthing bed. We had no fear, because God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but the power of love and the sound mind. Got her over to the birthing bed. Laid her down. I messed up. I propped her up with her pelvis aiming down into the mattress, you know, that's kind of hard to give birth when your baby is being pushed into the mattress. But I, how would I know? I'm an amateur, you know. No fear. So she lays back, and here comes Danny's head. Now, we thought, God didn't tell us, I thought the second one would be a boy. 
she asked me, because here comes Danny. I'm thinking that is the ugliest little girl I ever saw. That's what I'm thinking, right? I'm like, oh, that's one ugly girl. So, she, so the baby comes out and she says to me, she says, what is it? And see, I got this thought in my head, and this is what I talk about. You get a thought in your head, and it's wrong. It's wrong. I got it in my head. It was a girl. She says, what is it? I said, it's a girl, but guess what? I looked down, and I looked back up, and I looked down, and I said, it's a boy. <laughs> I was so happy. Well, the, the, the third son, Stephen, so now this is supernatural. Kathy, she gives birth so fast, I had to tell her, stop quoting scriptures. <laughs> stop speaking the word. I said, it's already good enough. I said, because the first one, Michael, she almost gave, when she got to the McConnellsburg Hospital and one of our elders' wives drove her there like she was, it was a miracle. They got there to McConnellsburg from Three Springs and the nurse said, my wife said, you better do something. I'm having this baby now. And the nurse kind of like, foo food. It's your first one. Foo food her way said, I am giving birth. So the, 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 the nurse pulled it back and there was Mikey. You know, and she got so excited when she went to prep her, she cut herself pretty bad with the, ra with the razor blade. Thank God she didn't cut Kathy. But what I'm saying is that, that and I said, Kathy, so Sunday morning, my wife is leading worship. She gets done. Now listen to this. She says, honey, I'm going into labor. And up in my heart, I told her, I said, you sit there and cross your legs. I'm preaching today. I mean, this really happened. Our life has been an adventure all the time. I said, you cross your legs. So I, I, it had to be God because she was giving birth like boom, you know. So she crosses her legs. I give Michael and Danny to, I don't know, to I get, did you, Donnie, take, I don't know who took Michael and, and, and Daniel. So I take her home, you know, and she gives birth to Stephen. But she sat there for an hour while I preached and administered to the people. An hour and a half. Got her in the car, got her home. Midwife had caught us that day. Do I need to hang around? We said, no, no, it's going to be okay. She got some Mar Martha Roher. Uh, she was a, 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 a Mennonite, uh, um, uh, uh, um, what do they call them? Midwife. midwife who had been in Africa, and she became our midwife, you know. And, but, but here comes the baby again. But see, it's because we, we've learned something. We've learned to not agree with the world. I don't agree with my body. When my body tells me, you're sick, you got a major disease, I'll laugh at it. Now, sometimes full of pain. I mean, four times kidney stones had hit me. You don't understand, I stood in this pulpit every time, and a lot of times, blood running down my leg. And I'm preaching, and I didn't say a word about it. I'd go to bed and wake up, and it's like I never had the kidney stones. And one time this went on for, I don't know, it went on for about three, four weeks. I mean, I'm standing here, and I'm preaching a storm. And a lot of times while I'm preaching, the power of God would hit me, and it was like I didn't have them. You know, then I'd leave the pulpit and it'd try to hit me again. Well, pastor, you're crazy. No, I'm not crazy. I'm just in harmony. I'm just in unity. I'm just in oneness with God in that area. I wish I could tell you I was in harmony with God in every area. But, but let's, let's read this a little bit further. We're not going to get into this tonight. I wish I could, but uh, sister, uh, she's going to be preaching. But notice what it says here. And now, O Father, listen, verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me. And now, O Father, glorify thou me in thine, in thine own self with glory, which I have with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou, hast them, uh, thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy... They have kept thy... What, what, you know, in, 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 in John 15, he says, I no longer call you servants because I call you friends because you do what I say. He said, you're my friends because you agree with everything I say. Now, I, I'm not a yes man to anybody but God. How many know we can agree with God without hesitation because God cannot lie? No, no, listen, this will change your life if you'll believe this. It is impossible for God to lie. 
So when we were putting the building up, some of the same stories had a crane one day, right, Donnie? The rest of it, you know, I'm only in my 30s. I'm a young man lifting up them heavy girders. And us men, we're, we're building this building, about 30 of us. And then it got down to 20 of us. And then me and Donnie, we, we, we did all the sheeting on the front part of this building. I mean, we got burnt real bad because we, we that, you know, helped pillars out, you know, beginning, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, as time goes on, like Jesus began with seven, he ended up with 11, didn't he? That's just normal. Because it's like running a race. When you first begin one of these marathons, you got a thousand people in a race. But by the time you get to the end of the race, my wife and I went somewhere and they had horse races up on the screen. I don't watch horse races. But, but I was amazed. I found out, first of all, the person who's usually in the front, the horse in the front never wins. It's usually the horse that's all the way in the back or they're halfway up or whatever. So it don't matter how you began your race, it's how you end it. But there is always crowded together. Here you got thousands of people. They're running, they're running. But, you know, a couple hours later, you got what? You got 10, 20, 30, 40 people there. That's just how life is. Well, in the midst of it, I felt something terror in my abdomen. And here I got a hernia. I have a little bit of experience with hernia. I've dealt with people with hernia. I know what hernias can do. And I kind of passively, say passively, I kind of passively came against it. I wasn't aggressive. Well, it got worse, and it got worse. It just got bad. So I thought it was three years. Kathy said it was two. It got so bad, I'm telling you, it was like a bag filled with water hanging out of my gut. I mean, that's how bad it got. It was a, a bag. You ever take a plastic bag and put water in it, like a, like a sandwich bag? It's hanging out. I said to myself in my heart, okay, now, God, you can't lie. Your word can't lie. Your word is true. What can I do to prove it to you? And the thought came to me, take my fingers and shove that back up in you. So I did it. After a couple hours, it'd come out. I did it again, and I did it again, and I did. For two weeks, I shoved that back in, two weeks. I would have done it for three years. I would have done it the rest of my life. Why? Because I know God can't lie. I'm in agreement with God. Y'all reach up and grab this. This is faith. I'm in agreement with God. Now, I, I know Brother J.R., he fell in our side, and I mean, it was terrible looking. And God did miracles for his legs. And, and I asked myself, if I was laying on the floor, ground like him with his bone protruded and all messed up, I can't honestly tell you what I would have done. I, I, can't, I can't say. I, I might have gone in and got the bone set. I don't know. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Because all I know is I got to live moment by moment. I don't live with what ifs. I live with the here and now. So God forbid if in, for some reason I end up in the hospital next week, my pride would not be popped. You know why? Because I don't have pride in this area. It don't matter what people think. All that matters is what does God think? So I went to bed after two weeks one night. I got up the next morning, and it was like I never had it. It's like I never had the hernia. I mean, there is no sign of it, and it's never come back in, 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 in 30-some years. Why? Because I'm in agreement with God. So let, let's go a little bit deeper. It gets so good here. It gets so good. I just can't let you go yet. I just can't. I just. Oh, my. Oh, now they have known that all things, whichever thou has given me, are of thee. For I have given, given unto them what? Verse 8. I have given them what? The words. the words which thou gavest me. Do you know it's God's word that is his glory? The glory that God, thou gavest me, I've given them. Here you are. People are trying to find God's glory, and it's right there in their hands. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Amen. You're looking for God's glory. He's given it to you. You got to get it in your heart. Right. That's right. See, I'm convicted as I'm preaching to you. You've got to get it into your heart. And then we'll have a move of God like the, the Lord spoke to me. He said one day, he said, I'm going to raise up another. He said, I'm going to raise up Joshua's in these last days in Caleb's. 
What did he tell Joshua? This book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate there and day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You don't have to find another formula. You don't have to find another principle. You don't have to find another solution. We've got it right here in our hearts. It's in our heart. But be transformed. Be transformed. Now listen, do not think I'm attacking these things because I'm not. Be transformed by fasting. It doesn't say that. Be transformed by prayer. It doesn't say that. Be transformed by, you know, what, what, uh, you know whatever. No. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by getting prayers of deliverance over you every day of your life. It doesn't say that. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What? That you can prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Well, Pastor Mike, don't you know? Don't you know? No, I don't have a spirit of fear. My family, we only for a little bit do we have uh, in, uh, health insurance. And that was because uh, we were at our Assembly God Church and I had them cancel it. My children... And we have been raised with no medical cards or health insurance because we believe that by his stripes we're healed. What if, what if, what if? Well, if what if happens, we're going to deal with it when it happens. That's when we're going to deal with it. We're just going to, you know, all those poor people in North Carolina, guess what they're finding out? This one family... It was a mudslide from the heavy rain came and took down their house. And the insurance company told them, we're so sorry you're not covered by mudslides. Listen, most of those people who got insurance, they're finding out that it was not in their policy. So they've lost everything they had, even though they put all that money in all those years. Now, I know it's a law to have automobile insurance. I have automobile insurance. I'm not attacked. It's not about the insurance. It's not about, it's about us agreeing with God. The eyes of the Lord are roaming to and fro upon the face of the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose hearts are perfect towards him. And the Hebrew means you are in agreement with God. That's why he called Abraham his friend three times in the old and one in the new. He said, Abraham, my friend. You know why? Because Abraham agreed with him. God said, Abraham, leave the city of the Chaldeans. Yes, sir. He goes. Live in a tent. He lived in his house his whole life in the city. Yes, sir. He, He wasn't a tent dweller. And, and then he, he, he and, and of course, and he, 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 God said, I'm going to, I'm going to make you love thus and thus and thus like the sands and the stars. And, but he got, but his, I'm not blaming his wife, his wife, because after, you know, all those years, 20 some years, no baby. And God knew this was going to happen. And, 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 and his wife says, no, honey, we got We got to use some common sense here. You know, in the land we live, it's, it's okay. I've got a comp, concubine, and you can impregnate her, and that baby will be considered yours and mine. And, and it's okay, because God, see how the devil works? It's okay, that, because this is how God works. So he believed her. I don't know how long she kept telling him that. So he impregnated, you know, Hagar, has a baby. Ishmael raises him for 10 years. He's a blessing to him, and... You know, and to, to, no, 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 he was a wild man. He was an ass of a man, the Bible said. But anyway, so one day God shows up and said, okay, now, Abraham. He said, it's time for Sarah to have a baby. He argued with God. He just, there's things in our life we will argue with God about. We'll argue with him. And, 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 and Abraham said this. Now listen, this is where it gets so, and, and we want to finish up down here in, chat, in verse 21 because it's just, we'll, we'll finish up down there in verse 20. But listen, he said, no, no, Ishmael got Ishmael. See, he was so, he got so penetrated in his mind and his heart by the society and the culture he was raised in that it had to be Ishmael. 
And God said, no, it's not Ishmael. You're, and his wife, Sarah, laughed when she heard it. And that's why I believe that God, he said, I got the last laugh. You're going to name this kid Isaac. I'm going to get the last laugh. And so finally, Sarah, including Sarah and including Abraham, they finally saw it. And it says, Sarah conceived seed by faith. Something happened. I mean, she's the one who suggested Hagar. And here she was. Ten years later, something ha- I'm believing something's going to happen in the body of Christ. We're going to stop arguing with God's word. We're going to stop disagreeing with the promises. And we are going to have a switch in our heart. And we're going to be like Sarah. And we are going to conceive. And we are going to give birth to a movement of joy the world has never seen before. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. And then Abraham, his faith. Sarah gives birth. I don't know how old Isaac was. One day he knows the voice of God because faith brings you into hearing God's voice loud and clear. Loud and clear. That's where faith takes you. You know, let's read this. Oh, I had so much more. But look here, verse 20. Now the prayer for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their, through their, what are we preaching? We're preaching the word. Not our opinions, not our circumstances, not politics, not current events. Why ain't God moving? Because people aren't preaching the word. That they all may be One, what's making us one? The word. So people want the body of Christ to have unity. The only place there's unity is in agreement with the word. There is no other place of agreement. The reason why some of us get along so wonderful. So Wayne here some time ago, he came to me and he said to me, he said, Pastor Mike, you know, I don't agree with everything that you preach. And I know what he means. He's saying, If what you're saying contradicts what the word says, I don't agree with that. Is that what you're saying, Wayne? I know what you're saying. And I agree with him. But we don't get in strife over it. We just say, Father, if Pastor Mike is not teaching the word in its proper content, you say, God, speak to his heart. Why? Because I'm open for correction. Because you know why? I love the truth. I don't love the doctrine that maybe got a hold of me that's wrong. I love the truth. So anybody can come to me and show me the truth in content, and I've done it. And they said, Pastor Mike, what you said this morning, that's not exactly correct. Look what the Bible says here. And I'll look at the whole chapter, and I'll go, wow, that's what it says. Wonderful. I had a woman come to me one time. She was really confused because I said something Sunday morning. Uh, Mary Rockwell, who's a good friend of ours who now lives in Florida, she's almost 90. She said, Pastor Mike, you said this this morning. I said, okay, Mary. Well, that's wrong. I said, okay, show me. So she showed me. So I said, you're right. Well, that's wrong. Praise the Lord. I'm getting more and more in a harmony with God. So that night I stood up and I said, listen, I said this this morning and um, I was wrong. This is what the Bible really says. Brother, Sister Mary came to me and this is what she, and this is, okay, so I, I, I'm getting more in line with God's word. That a guy came to me mad. Pastor Mike, you're so confused. I said, I'm not confused at all. Yeah, but you said that this morning and tonight you repented and said this. I said, no, no, no. It's just like you make adjustments with your car. If you're going off into a ditch, You get straightened up. And so that guy and his family left the church because he said, I was confused. But I wasn't confused. I was just getting more on the straight and narrow way. (laughs) Well, Pastor Mike, what if everybody leaves? Well, Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they couldn't agree with him. And out the door they went. And I'm going to tell you, eat his flesh and drink his blood or you have no life in you. You have no zoe in you. We got to eat his flesh and drink his blood. What's that? The word of God? And he said, my word's a spirit and air life. 
that they all may be one as thou art, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be, uh, uh, be one uh, in us, that the world may, what, believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them and thou and me, that the world may be perfect, be, that they may be made perfect and mature and one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Listen, it's all about this oneness with God, harmony with God, unity with God, in sync with God, in tune with God. That, that you say, what's the purpose of my life? Come into harmony with the word. Come into harmony with God. What is God saying about your circumstance? Begin to say to yourself what God says about it. Like I said, you know, I, I, you know, somebody came to me, his name was Mark Moore, and I was wearing my glasses, and I'm preaching a message on faith, and I got my glasses on, so what? He says, Pastor Mike, God told me. Don't listen to everybody that says God told me. Yeah. What's that? He was a young buck. What did he tell you, Mark? God says you're supposed to step on your glasses. Well, I should have said to him, well, when God tells me to, I'll do that. When God tells me to do that, I'll do that. But I pulled my glasses off, I stomped them up real good, and went out and bought another pair. <laughs> because I wasn't there at the time. You can't fake this stuff. But how did I get there? I began to agree with God in my own personal life. I began to agree with God. Lord, I thank you. I'm healed. I thank you. My eyes are made whole. I thank you. I don't need those glasses. Nobody heard it out of my mouth. The only one that heard it was God, me saying, I agree with you, God. I agree with you, God. You hear me? I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. And got shocked three months later when it manifested. Have you ever believed God for something and you were shocked when it happened? You know why that is? Because that's how good God is. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Come on. Come on. Come on. So he said to Ezekiel, you know, every one of these men of faith, they all agreed with God. When God said, Joshua, okay, uh, you're going to circle Jericho once every day, six days. On the seventh day, you're going to circle it seven times. Keep your lips zipped. On the seventh time, the seventh day, shout. And the walls will fall down. And the Bible says when he did it, that's when the walls came down. What do you mean? When you do what God tells you to do, it will happen. And it's not my job to make it happen. He does it. I, I don't do it. He does it. When I signed, when, when we got this big uplink dish, and I had nobody left in this church, maybe 20 of us, including my family. And I'm up here one day praying. And he said, okay, son, begin. I said, what? Begin to broadcast 24 hours a day. Now, when I had 700 people, I couldn't, get, I couldn't broadcast. Couldn't get the preachers. Didn't have the money. Didn't have the equipment. I've got nobody. And I said, okay. I didn't argue. I said, okay. I knew it was God. I, I didn't want to broadcast. I don't want to. That re he said, call up NPR. I didn't even know NPR did this. In D.C., I heard the Lord say, call up NPR. So I, I called. What, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying as you come into agreement with God, you will hear his voice so loud, so clear, it will scare you. We're on I-35 West, 2007, going through Minneapolis, and I had an unction. Get off the road. Get off the road. I, I, didn't, I, I never had that before. I told my family, they said, obey God. Went north, caught a, a, a highway, went across the Mississippi, looked up there at the KOA TV screen, and here the bridge over I-35 collapsed with hundreds and hundreds of vehicles, and we would have been on that pulling our 35-foot uh, trailer behind our truck. The next year, whole chunk Indian tribe, preaching for them in the reservation, Wisconsin Dell. And that was you, Bill. I think, well, Bill just had to leave. But it was so, so I'm preaching, it's raining, and I heard the audible voice of God. He said, leave tonight. I heard him. I said to the Indians, I said, I'm so sorry, we got to leave tonight. My kids say, Dad, you've never cut a meeting short. I said, I know, I know. I don't know what's going on. God, God doesn't always tell me what's going on. But I know the voice of God. Tell somebody, I know the voice of God. Now, God's voice would never contradict his word, his character, his nature, his personality. 
So if God's telling you to leave the woman you got and get another woman, that's a devil. We're going to cast it out of you. Okay? There, there's a lot of that foolishness going on. You know? Well, God told me to kick my husband out of the house. I don't think so. But anyways, God told me to get rid of this woman and get another woman. I don't think so. So anyways, that's just the devil. But anyway, so, so I, I, I said, we got to leave tonight. So we went back to the campsite. The Spirit of God came on Danny in the rain, picking everything up, packed everything up, hooked up. We pull away because we're camping there at the dam, largest man-made lake in Wisconsin, largest earth dam in Wisconsin, and the water is running, running, running. And my wife says, man, there's something wrong here, honey. You see all the water that's rushing. And we drove all that night through hail and, and miniature tornadoes and heavy fog. We pull into our driveway, our parking lot, and all of a sudden Bill Pritt shows up. He comes up and he says, because I didn't have a TV, he says, Pastor, Pastor Mike, did you hear what happened in Wisconsin, July in 2008? You can look it up. He said the dam at Dell Lake broke. We would have all been washed away. But I heard the voice of God. So we'll finish the story. Broadcasts on. I didn't argue. I said, okay, God, my equipment wasn't up to date. I had no money. I had no preachers. I had nothing. Call up NPR. I said, okay, God. So I caught up NPR. They send out two guys in three piece suits. They come into a building that's basically abandoned. Basically. I'm sitting up in the front office. They come in. They lay down a contract, a three year contract, $12,000 a month, 250000 contract. And I signed my John Hancock. $250,000, no money, no preachers, not the right equipment. And to make a long story short, they gave me one month. In one month, we were up and broadcasting for, for three. And actually, we've been broadcasting ever since. Give the Lord a hand clap. Hallelujah. How does that happen, Pastor Mike? How, how can God speak so clear, so loud? Agree with him. Agree with God. Begin to decide, I am going to be. Don't worry about these big, elaborate, awesome miracles I'm talking about. No, begin where you're at. Begin, let the weak say, I'm strong. Begin to say, my husband is going to be on fire for God. God's going to fill him with the Holy Ghost. God is going to transform him. God's going to get a hold of my children. Lord, I thank you. You hear my prayers. God, you're going to rescue my kids. You're pulling them out of the pit of hell. You're, you're delivering them from the drugs and the alcohol and the immorality. God, you can have what you say when it's in agreement with God. People won't quit their jobs. I've told people, man, you're in a job you hate. You're miserable. You're complaining. Just quit it. They said, quit my job. Yeah, I believe. I've done it many times before I got was full-time ministry. I'd say, man, I'm out of here. And I turn around and believe God for a better job. I mean, I'm at Broken Arrow School District, and this guy who is my boss, who's a big, heavy homosexual, picking on me all the time. I'm working at night while everybody else is coffee clutching. I'm in my main classroom. I'm way ahead of schedule, buffing the floor, because what you do, do it as unto the Lord. He comes in there, starts cussing and swearing at me, gets in my face, yelling at me, and I heard the Lord say, quit. Now, I needed that money. I was already $500 short every month by the end of the month. Never told anybody. God, when I left Rhema, it was, everything was paid for, praise God. But never told anybody. See, faith doesn't tell everybody in order to get them to have compassion on you to give you money. That's, right. That's why a lot of these preachers, they're not operating in faith. They're manipulating people. I'm not saying you don't share your dream, your vision. That's fine. But, man, you don't manipulate the people. So... I said, I quit. He yelled at me. He got so mad. You can't quit. I was the best worker he had. I was doing all of their work. There was five of them in there, and I was doing everybody else's work because I was doing it as unto God. And nobody knew what I was doing but them people there. So I, I quit. He's yelling at me as I'm walking down the hallway, yelling at me. So I, I, I get home, and it's the weekend, and I said, you know, baby, you know what's really in my heart? She said, what? I said, because he said, ask what you will and it shall be done. I'd like to work at Rhema. I'd like to work for Kenneth Hagin. 
Let's hold hands. We're newlyweds, you know. So we hold hands. I pray a simple prayer. I said, Lord, I thank you. I got a job at Rhema. I don't know what it is. But, Lord, I thank you. I qualified for it. We got it. So we just began to praise God. Monday morning, we go to Rhema. At the end of the day, an announcement comes over the speaker system and says, uh, we have positions opening on maintenance here at Rama. If you'd like to have a job, please check in. I went in, filled out the paperwork, and the next day I had a brand new job. I was working for Rama. Ended up working with Dub Hagen, the older brother of Brother Hagen. That was a trip. Ended up at Brother Hagen's house. Never talked to Brother Hagen. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? I'm saying. God says, I want you to become one with me. Do you want to be? Listen, don't marry a man you don't want to be one with and think you're going to change him. You're goofy. (laughs) No, Kathy married me because she liked, not physically, I don't think, she liked what she saw. I was on fire for God. And I think that's the only thing Kathy really likes about me. (laughs) Honestly. She might like some other parts of me. I don't know. (laughs) Lord, we thank you now. This word will not return void. Reach up and grab it, people. Grab it, grab it, grab it. Grab that oneness. Grab that oneness. Grab that oneness. 